Okay. Nope. I think it's pretty pretty good. Did yeah. you get your pointer to work? Pointer. I did not get my pointer to work. Yeah, I, I can just use the mouse, right? No, you can't. I'll pull let's see this. There. Uh, okay, pointer. Do you know how to make it? Uh, if you are you in your presentation? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, also pointer. Okay. But when you do that, when you have your electronic, you want to change your screen. Yeah. Just do that. Okay. That works. I need to come off. You have to go back here. Okay. Put your picture off and then just do the laser off. Oh, okay. So that's pretty easy. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, and you have clips or like movie clips? No, I don't. I don't know. Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Wednesday morning uh, cardiology rounds. Um, this morning, it's my pleasure to introduce one of our uh, interventional fellows, Dr. Omar Abdel Razak. He's um, in his second year of uh, interventional cardiology, um, focusing on uh, this year uh, structural, and he's going on to do another year of uh, structural cardiology um, down in the States next year. So we look forward to his talk this morning. Uh, just a reminder to everyone that next week is. Um, grand rounds. Um, there will have been an invite uh, from research services uh, to sign up for that event, so please join. So welcome, Omar. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Dr. Sadnik. Uh, and I'll share my slides so everybody can see. Um, um, all right, so as Dr. Stanek mentioned, my name is Omar. I'm one of the intervention fellows with a focus on structural heart. Um, and I'll be doing another year's structural heart next year. So I just wanted to talk to everybody about sort of what's up and coming in structural heart uh, in the next few years and, and sort of uh, give a little primer on what's what's, what's already been done uh, and just to frame what's going to happen in the next few years. Um, so briefly, I'm going to talk about mitral interventions, tricuspid interventions, um, LV remodeling interventions, intraatrial shunt devices, uh, and briefly talk about coronary sinus reduction. And um, hopefully I can do all that uh, in 45 minutes or so. Uh, so it'll be a little bit of a roll in, but I'll do my best. Um, so in terms of transcatheter mitral interventions, I think everyone's pretty familiar with transcatheter edge to edge repair. Um, this isn't a new technology. We've been doing this for at least 10 years here at the Heart Institute um, with the predominant um, technology used in Canada anyways, the, the mitral clip. Um, and this is just a picture showing the steerable guiding catheter and the, and the clip delivery system that we use every, we use every week here. Um, uh, the mitral clip has, has uh, evolved even during that time period with multiple generations. We're now on our fourth generation um, with wider clips, with longer arms, and the ability to grab one leaflet at a time. So even in this technology that's quote unquote older, uh, it continues to evolve. And we expect to have a fifth generation in the next year or two um, uh, with hopefully improvements in how we treat patients. Um, so all of this should be you know, sort of 
review of, of data that we that we've reviewed before here. But um, you know, it was first studied in 2011 um, in the Everest two trial. So uh, this was a study that compared uh, primary uh, patients with primary mitral regurgitation, um, moderate or severe uh, primary uh, mitral regurgitation, to either transcatheter mitral valve repair or conventional surgery. Um, and this is in the very early days of of mitral clips. So um, in the infancy of our experience as imagers and as as proceduralists with with this technique. Um, uh, and this study, uh, you know, uh, the data that they showed was that uh, for the primary endpoint, which is freedom of, from surgery uh, to death or grade three or four plus MR, surgery was superior to to mitral clip, primarily driven by the need for repeat surgery in the in the percutaneous arm. Um, so. Um, Oh, uh, here we go. Pointer. Here, uh, only two patients in the surgical arm needed repeat intervention, whereas thirty-seven patients in the in the percutaneous arm needed reintervention. Um, again, infancy of this technique, um, but suggested that mitral clip was not ready for prime time at that point. I think the important part from this study is the safety outcomes. So mitral clip is very safe in this patient population with with similar, if not better, safety outcomes. Uh, for these patients. Um, that led us to the COAP study, um, which is a bigger study, 614 patients looking at secondary MR. Uh, and I think everybody's familiar with this. So they randomized patients with secondary MR, uh, moderate to severe symptomatic secondary MR to either mitral clip uh, or medical therapy. Um, and they showed reduction in hospital in their composite outcome of hospitalizations for heart failure uh, and death at two years. Um, as well as the, the safety of the procedure. Um, and so when you compare mitral clip to, to sort of the most widely used transcatheter technique, TAVI, um, you see number need, numbers needed to treat, which are very similar. So the number needed to treat for TAVI in inoperable severe AS, so sort of the highest risk patients with, with AS who are most likely to have poor outcome, the number needed to treat is four. Uh, mitral clip for patients with severe secondary MR, the number needed to treat is six. Uh, so, so a highly effective uh, technique. Um, uh, and when you um, when you look at um, the results out to five years, uh, you you, um, you have a reduction in heart failure hospitalization uh, in this uh, in this patient population, fifty seven percent reduction, fifty fifty seven percent. Uh, hospitalization in the guideline directed medical therapy arm versus 33% only in the in the device arm. So um, much less heart failure hospitalizations. And you see that the curves diverge early. So, you know, at 12 months, the curves are sort of divergent and they stay divergent. Um, and that's also the case for their for their primary outcome, which is the composite of death or heart failure hospitalization. So 92% um, of patients in the control arm had heart failure hospitalization or death versus 73% only in the in the mitra clip group. Um, um, and this is this is just to show that that at two years in in co-op you're actually allowed to cross over, uh, and about forty five percent of patients in the guideline directed medical therapy arm actually crossed over to um, mitral clip at two years. Um, so you see, as you expect with with mitral clip, patients have awesome reduction in their mitral regurgitation. So about ninety five percent of patients at five years have two plus or less MR um, versus sort of fifty percent in the guideline directed medical therapy arm. Uh, but you see the jump in reduction in MR at two years. Um, so the results I just showed you, the the diverging of the curves is despite a lot of patients uh, crossing over to to mitral clip, um, suggesting you know not only a durable result of mitral clip in, in this patient population, but a role for early mitral clip in patients that patients tend to do better if you get to them earlier. There we go. Um, in terms of other technology that's out there for for the uh, for mitral tier, um, there's also the Pascal, which is which has been studied in its own randomized control trial. Um, this technology is relatively similar to to mitral clip. The biggest difference, as I see it, is the central spacer. So um, you have this bigger spacer in the middle, which helps bridge the coaptation gap. So it kind of fills the mitral space a little better. Um, and when this was studied in their early feasibility study, they showed safety of the uh, of the device. So 72% survival at two years and 78% freedom from heart failure hospitalization in two years. 
Um, and then Pascal was compared to MitroClip in his own randomized control trial. Um, so um, they compared <coughs> MitroClip to, to Pascal um, with regards to safety and effectiveness, and there was no difference. Uh, uh, Pascal was not inferior to what was studied in COAPT uh, for both safety and effectiveness, and their effectiveness outcome here was was not a clinical one. It was it was mitral regurgitation, but but similar. Um, so just to show again, uh, big reduction in mitral regurgitation with both. Uh, so 98% of patients with Pascal had two plus or less MR. 98% of patients with MitroClip had two plus or less MR. Uh, so highly effective techniques, uh, and it remains to be seen which patients do better with which technology. Um, both very safe with low um, major adverse event rates, so freedom of major adverse event rates in the 90% range for both. Um, so what does that look like in real life? Um, so this is from the expand registry, which was published earlier this year. Um, so this looked at patients in the US, uh, over a thousand patients in the US who had um, a mitral tier. Um, and you, and what you see is uh, you, uh, 99 percent procedural success rate uh, and 96 percent of patients with less than two plus MR or two plus or less MR um, with infrequent adverse events. Um, uh, so this is for all patients in the study. This is for patients with the primary MR, a little bit lower rates of two plus MR uh, or a little bit uh, uh, yeah lower rates of two plus MR, better with secondary MR in that study. With regards to clinical outcomes in the registry, so when they compared the patients in the year prior to to mitral tier versus the year following, uh, there was a reduction in heart failure hospitalization rate from um, fifty eight percent in the uh, fifty eight percent to eighteen to nineteen percent once they were treated. So massive reduction in heart failure hospitalization. Um, they did have an all cause mortality rate of fifteen percent, um, which seems relatively high at one year, but I'll show you that that number is relatively similar to what's seen in randomized control data for, for mitral tier. Patients who received mitral tier felt better, so 80% um, of patients had NYHA 1 to 2 symptoms um, versus at baseline only about 20% of patients had NYHA plus 1 to 2 symptoms. Uh, and then you had an improvement in, in KCCQ score, Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire score uh, of 22 points at a year. Um, so patients felt better subjectively uh, with uh, with much less MR. Um, I mentioned about safety, and I think we're all familiar that this is becoming a safer technique as we gain experience with it. Um, low rates of MI, uh, single leaflet detachment, and the need for mitral valve replacement surgery is quite low in this uh, in this registry. Um, I mentioned to you the all cause mortality rate, but that rate is sort of comparable to what you see in in, in tricuspid valve intervention or mitral valve interventions uh, in other RCTs. So in Everest two, the rate was twenty four percent, in COAP nineteen percent mortality at, at one year. So uh, it's a function of the patient population, not necessarily the technique. Um, so that's mitral tier. So what else is out there for mitral interventions? So. Um, Annuloplasty is something that's done commonly in the surgicals on the surgical side. So about 94% of patients who undergo uh, mitral valve intervention actually get annuloplasty, and that's you don't you somewhat achieve that indirectly with with mitral tear. Um, so there have been techniques that have been developed to try and do this percutaneously. So there's this cardio band. Um, uh, intervention, which is uh, a transcatheter device, which is meant to reduce uh, MR through annular reduction. So it's this ring that goes around the annulus percutaneously uh, and meant to facilitate leaflet coaptation and reduce your mitral regurgitation. Um, this was studied in, a, in uh, uh, 60 patients uh, and they showed safety of, of the of the device. So 80% of patients, 80% uh, survival at two years for this device. Um, with good reduction in mitral regurgitation, so 96% of patients with uh, two plus or less mitral regurgitation at two years. Um, so this this device is now um, in a bigger randomized study to try and suss out clinical outcomes with with this device uh, with more patients. Um, there's also this Carillon device, which which has a similar idea. Um, the idea is that you cinch the mitral valve, or you sit, you reshape the mitral annulus um, uh, through the coronary sinus, um, 
So you have this anchor that sits in the coronary sinus and then another anchor that sits in the in the great cardiac vein. And this is a small device uh, that goes um, through the IJ. Um, and the purported advantage of this is that you save your septum, so you don't need to do a transeptal puncture for this device. You can do it all through the through the coronary sinus. Um, um, and it's a smaller system. It's a 10 French system. Um, this has only been studied in 50 patients so far, and they've shown some reduction in mitral regurgitation as well as other echo parameters without really significant reductions in, in clinical and functional outcomes. So no difference in mortality, no difference in heart failure hospitalization yet. Um, some improvement in KCCQ score, it's some improvement in NYHA uh, class uh, symptoms. Again, this is being studied in a larger randomized trial now. Um, so just to summarize what's going on in the mitral world, uh, I think we're familiar with mitral tier. It's it's uh, we've shown you know at five years that it's safe, it's efficacious. Um, patients do well with it. Our experience is strong with it. There's low rates of death, MI, SLDA, and requirement for repeat mitral intervention. Um, it, and that's mainly for secondary mitral regurgitation. With regards to primary mitral regurgitation, um, there is no randomized. There is no robust randomized data yet. So there is a, a randomized study assessing primary MR um, surgery versus mitral tier um, to assess efficacy. And, and we're enrolling in that study or have been enrolling in that study for, for a little while. Um, and then you've got the experimental devices, which you know are interesting, but have not uh, been sussed out and haven't proven that they, they work quite yet. Um, in terms of transcatheter tricuspid interventions, um, you know, the rationale for addressing the tricuspid valve is that it's associated with decreased survival and poor quality of life, um, and that there's not a lot of therapy available to this patient population. So um, treatment is mainly diuretics with surgery reserved only for, for selected patients. Um, so based on the success that, that Structural Worlds had with mitral tier, uh, tier has been attempted in the tricuspid position, um, initially without randomized data, uh, but I'll show you some randomized data for tricuspid tier now. Um, this is just to show um, the increase in, in mortality in patients based on their tricuspid regurgitation. So the worse your TR is, the less likely you are to do well, the more likely you are to die. Um, there's not really any great data out there to show that there's anything that we can intervene on or that any intervention modifies this. Um, and that's kind of the goal of, of studies that are ongoing. So I know um, uh, people are probably, Probably pretty familiar with triluminate as it came out recently, um, but just to go through it quickly, um, this was a tricuspid ed a transcatheter edge to edge repair in a fashion similar to mitriclip, uh, essentially the same technology. Um, and in the in the randomized trial, what they did was they uh, were attempting to assess the safety and effectiveness of this technique uh, in patients with severe TR who are at intermediate or greater risk of mortality with tricuspid valve surgery. Um, so they enrolled 450 patients at 80 sites, and we enrolled patients here, uh, and their composite endpoint was mortality, tricuspid surgery, heart failure hospitalization, uh, quality of life as assessed by KCCQ score at 12 months. As I mentioned, they it was symptomatic TR in patients on stable guideline-directed medical therapy uh, with greater than intermediate risk for surgery. Um, just a quick look at the patient population that was studied. More of an elderly patient population than what we'd normally see in, in cardiovascular trials. So uh, patients are 78 with more renal disease, more, more liver disease. Uh, and I just wanted to show how much TR they actually had. So a lot of patients with 6 plus, 5 plus MR. So you know, about 70% of patients with massive or torrential mitral reg uh, tricuspid regurgitation. So um, lots of TR. Um, so unsurprisingly, intervening on the tricuspid valve with edge-to-edge -edge repair reduced your tricuspid regurgitation. So um, at baseline, um, you know, at, in the control arm, only 4.8% of the patients had two, uh, two plus or less MR or moderate or less MR versus in the in the intervention arm, 87% of the patients achieved a reduction of or in their tricuspid, sorry, tricuspid regurgitation to, um, to, to uh, two plus or less. Um, they actually showed superiority for their, for their primary outcome, uh, but this was primarily driven by improvement in their KCCQ score, which is subjective, obviously. So with regards to their, their hard clinical endpoints, there was no difference in mortality or need for tricuspid valve surgery, and there was no difference in heart failure hospitalization. 
Um, so primarily driven by a difference in KCCQ score of greater than 15 points. Um, and sort of unsurprisingly, the improvement in KCCQ score or the improvement in quality of life was associated um, with how much TR reduction you got. So if you ended up with moderate or less TR, your your um, uh, your KCCQ score was went down by 16 points. Uh, and if you got more than two grade reduction in, in uh, tricuspid regurgitation, it went down by 18 points. And that's including patients that went from six plus to four plus MR. Um, so so uh, the amount of color that you end up with at the at your post procedure echo um, is important. Uh, in terms of clinical outcomes. Um, importantly, in terms of safety, this was a safe procedure. Um, so in terms of major adverse events, they only had three, uh, two new onset renal failures and one cardiovascular death. Um, and in terms of their sort of non-major adverse events, uh, low rates of precuspid valve surgery, um, low rates of, of single leaflet detachment, uh, low rate, no, nobody embolized, um, and low rates of major bleeding. Again, um, speaking to the familiarity that that the structural world has gotten with with um, uh, tear um, from the mitral world, from the mitral side. Um, so just to summarize, triluminate um, it's effective in reducing tricuspid regurgitation. Results are sustained out to a year. Um, the composite endpoint uh, was met, but primarily driven by quality of life. Quality of life is related to the degree, degree of tricuspid regurgitation, uh, and it's safe. So low rates, low event rates at 30 days. Um, you know some of the limitations, and there's a few, and I won't beat it to death. But this is an unblinded study, so if your if your outcome is driven by a subjective uh, uh, by a subjective outcome, um, patients know what they've gotten, so they may feel better because you've treated them. Um, and there's no difference in in sort of hard clinical outcomes yet with this technology. So uh, no difference in mortality, heart failure, hospitalization, or six minute walk distance. Um, and that kind of leaves the door open for other tricuspid interventions. So there's the class two TR trial, which is the Pascal tra uh, transcatheter edge to edge repair device, which is um, which I mentioned for the mitral side. Um, essentially the same thing. It just has this bigger spacer, which we think would be useful in, in tricuspid regurgitation because of the size of coaptation defects that we see. Um, so they're comparing this device to optimal medical therapy at two years. So and the composite outcome that they're looking at, that we'll be looking at because we're enrolling in that study is all cause mortality, our vet implantation, heart transplant, heart failure hospitalization, and quality of life uh, at 24 months. Um, so just to summarize what's out there on trans, uh, tricuspid valve edge to edge repair, uh, there's one study with improvement in quality of life index. There's a second RCT out there, um, and it still remains to be determined which patient profile and which technology uh, gives the greatest safety and efficacy uh, profile. Um, and there are other techniques on the tricuspid side that I haven't had time to go through, but uh, there are other non leaflet directed therapies that that could be of use in, in tricuspid valve intervention, but there's still uh, early days for those. Um, quickly, I'll just talk about transcatheter uh, ventricular remodeling and reconstruction, um, which I think is pretty neat, but still very experimental. So um, there are a couple of techniques that uh, that are out there. Um, this is one that that is uh, sort of taken from from surgical literature. So uh, there's this idea that if you reshape a dilated left ventricle using a papillary mu muscle sling, so basically you cinch together the papillary muscles, um, you can improve um, your left ventricular and diastolic diameter and potentially improve your ejection fraction. Um, so so when this was studied on the surgical side, so this is a randomized study comparing just mitral valve annuloplasty versus mitral valve annuloplasty plus papillary muscle approximation. Um, at five years, there was a significant reduction in left ventricular and diastolic diameter, uh, as well as a, an improvement uh, in left ventricular uh, ejection fraction. Um, so uh, this technique has been taken um, through a retro aortic approach and uh, attempted to be um, implemented uh, in a tra with, through, a tra through a catheter, through a 17 French catheter. Um, and, and you essentially just cinch together the papillary muscles with the idea that you improve um, left ventricular dilation. 
Um, so this is very early days. So it's still in its first human study, in human study. So they took patients with EFs of 20 to 40 percent uh, without severe mitral regurgitation and, and sim with symptoms, NYJ class two to four symptoms, and they they are just looking at safety endpoints. Um, the first generation of the device was unsuccessful in the first five attempts, uh, but in that time, but since that time, they've they've had two successful implants. Um, and and they presented one case at, at THC this year where a patient did remarkably well um, with an improvement in their ejection fraction of by 14% uh, and an improvement in their KCC score, KCCQ score by 40 points. Um, so interesting, but still far away from wide clinical practice, but uh, interesting to me anyways. Um, sort of some of the advantages is that it's anchorless so there's nothing that actually attaches into the ventricular wall um, and as we've seen with with other techniques that once you start anchoring stuff into the ventricle or into valves there can be aneurysms or um, damage to the ventricular wall that that happens with that um, the idea is predicated on the surgical uh, literature that if you um, have direct effects on the lv myocardium that you can restore mitral valve geometry and improve patients forward flow um, Importantly, um, it doesn't preclude future mitral valve interventions. So if somebody wanted to do a mitral clip on one of these patients, you still could. Um, um, but it's still very early days and uh, still in first in human studies. Um, one other remodeling reconstruction technique with more uh, with more data is the AccuSynch um, technique, which is actually very similar, aside from that the this device has anchor, so it actually anchors it to the ventricular wall. Um, same reported uh, benefits that you decrease LV size, you decrease wall stress, and you, you initiate reverse remodeling. Um, so this is a little bit about technique, so I won't go through this in great detail, but Essentially, you access the LV retroaortic, um, and you use a guiding catheter to deliver this, uh, basically this sling that has anchors that attaches into the ventricle, and then you cinch it together. Um, uh, and I've got a couple of X-ray pictures here, just showing that. And this is kind of what the final result looks like. You cinch it together, and you just kind of cut this cable. Uh, and the idea is that you've brought the left ventricle together uh, through the anchors. Um, so they did do a multi-center single arm study to assess the safety and effectiveness of this. Um, again, similar patient population, patients with NYHA class two or greater symptoms, uh, on guideline directed medical therapy with dilated ventricles and EFs between 20 and 40%. Uh, and their primary outcome was a safety outcome. So freedom from device or femoral artery access, uh, major adverse events through 12 months. Um, and what they were able to show in the study, the course inch study, predominantly is that this is safe. Uh, so of the 51 patients, only five had major adverse events. Um, three were femoral access site complications, so um, associated with large bore access, um, and only one patient with a pericardial effusion or tamponade. So impressive, but again, a selected population in a single arm study. Um, and what they showed from a from an echo perspective is there was positive biologic reverse remodeling. So they were they were able to show that in the treatment arm or in, in the patients that were treated, um, at one year they were able to reduce the left ventricular end diastolic volume by 33. Uh, whether or not that's clinically important remains to be determined. Um, and they were able to improve ejection fraction by three points, whether that's clinically important or um, not, uh, or inter-observer differences uh, to be determined in bigger studies. Uh, importantly, there was an improvement in subjective uh, symptoms, so an improvement of KCCQ score at one year of 16 points, uh, and an improvement of NYHA class symptoms. So um, at baseline, 50% of patients with NYHA 1 and 2 symptoms um, in the 50 patients or 51 patients that were treated, 90% at NYHA 1 and 2 symptoms. So food for thought, uh, but not ready to be widely used yet anyways. Um, so this one, you know, I think the AccuSynch was interesting in that um, uh, it's fully transcatheter, it's favorable safety profile, uh, and has improvements in both echo and clinical outcomes. Um, and they're doing their pivotal randomized control trial to, to assess its safety. Um, 
So just to summarize ventricular remodeling, uh, it's got this physiological and surgical data that suggests a role for transcatheter re or LV remodeling. Um, how this pans out in the next, you know, 10 years or so uh, is to be determined. Um, next, I'll move on to intraatrial shunts, so um, which we've been heavily involved with here. Um, so the idea with intraatrial shunts is that you know when norm when healthy individuals exercise, uh, you can increase your stroke volume without increasing your 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 filling pressures. Um, but in patients with compliance issues, whether they have hef ref or hef pef, um, their left atrial pressure goes up when they exercise, um, and we see this. Uh, sort of pretty remarkably, even when patients put their feet up in the cath lab, that their left atrial pressures go up by, you know, sometimes five and ten millimeters of mercury just from having their feet up, let alone when they exercise. Um, and the idea is, when you increase your left atrial pressure, you increase your left atrial RA pressure gradient, um, so that cre creating an interatrial conduit should allow for decompensation of of the left heart uh, when you exercise. So you trade off left high left atrial pressures for high right atrial pressures and there's this idea that that improves symptoms um, and this is an interesting computational modeling model that they did prior to the core via study um, uh, where they as where they use this computational model to assess what size of shunt would actually um, uh, have the biggest impact on on pressure gradient from left atrium to right atrium and that's how they ended up with their eight millimeter device um, uh, and I'll go through that in, in, in a little bit. Um, in terms of devices that there are that are out there, there's sort of this arms race to figure out which device is going to work best. Uh, so there's a you know a couple of devices that are out there uh, in different phases uh, of of um, uh, of study. Um, so sort of the best studied one is the Corvia device. Um, so this is um, uh, a septal device. So this this is just an Basically, you poke a hole in the in the atri in the intraatrial septum, and you hold it open with this eight millimeter night null um, device. Um, and again, the idea that that you utilize that left atrium and right atrium gradient when patients exercise. Um, so they took patients with EFs greater than forty percent and elevated wedge pressures, um, and and they had promising results in their early feasibility study. Um, so they they studied in a randomized control trial, uh, which reduced LAPHF2, uh, which was published in 2022. Um, so they took 626 patients and they randomized them to either the atrial shunt device uh, or a sham procedure. And their composite endpoint was CV death, ischemic stroke, um, and heart failure events at 24 months, as well as KCCQ score. Um, and they actually, didn't show a difference in their composite endpoint um, uh, or in incidence of heart failure events. Um, granted that they had a very low event rate in this study, so only two less than two percent of patients had events in the study. So with six hundred patients alone, it would have been impossible to to show a difference. Um, but what they did show uh, is in a pre-specified subgroup, so patients without pulmonary vascular disease, so patients without elevated PVRs, um, which was 50% of patients in the study, um, there was a 45% reduction in heart failure events uh, and a 55% improvement in quality of life. Um, so hypothesis uh, provoking that in patients without significantly elevated PVRs, um, you might get a result. So they're doing a larger study to assess the subgroup uh, with more patients. You know, results of that will be available in the coming years. Um, so an interesting device. Um, uh, and then there's the device that we're most familiar with here, um, which is the left atrium to coronary sinus shunt, the aperture shunt. shunt. Um, so this utilizes um, a shunt from the left atrium to the coronary sinus. Um, uh, and the idea is you offload your left atrium into your coronary sinus and then into your right atrium. Um, and the Proposed benefit is that um, it preserves the intraatrial septum again for for future structural procedures uh, that require the intraatrial septum. Um, there's also this idea that if you give somebody an AST, uh, you might have the sequelae of an AST, so you might have uh, elevated RA pressures uh, and RV dilation. Uh, and the thought is that with this device, you might not get that. Uh, and I'll show you the results from from the early feasibility study um, for this device. Um, so this is this is just the equipment. Um, so there was 
this year we they, they recently published the single arm feasibility study for this implant. So they took 87, 87 patients with preserved EFs and symptomatic heart failure um, and, and implanted the device. Um, this is sort of the baseline characteristics of, of the study. So uh, a lot of patients with NYHA 2 and 4 symptoms. So uh, 3 and 4 symptoms, sorry. So 94% of patients with significant symptoms. 45% um, of patients with heart failure hospitalizations in the last year. So so sick patient population, high in pro BMPs for what it's worth. Uh, and in terms of baseline hemodynamics, elevated left atrial pressure. So mean wedges of 21. Uh, at rest and 36 at 20 watts of exercise. So in terms of safety of this device, um, the device was implanted in 90% of patients successfully um, with a low rate of procedural complications. So one patient with a device embolization, three patients with a pericardial effusion, and only two patients requiring repeat intervention uh, with, with cardiac surgery. Um, and 100% of the shunts that were, were reassessed at six months were patent. So um, suggesting that these stay open um, and continue to shunt up at, at six months. I mentioned the low event rate. Um, the two reinterventions, one was for device retrieval after it embolized. Um, and then one surgery was for coronary sinus repair uh, and drainage of a pericardial effusion. Um, so, so low event rates. Um, and then in terms of how effective it was, um, there was this difference, this mean difference of seven millimeters of mercury with this shunt uh, at six months compared to baseline. Uh, and it didn't matter if you had elevated uh, pulmonary vascular resistance or not. So if your PVR was high or low, you still had a, a an improvement in your, uh, um, in, in your left atrial pressure. Um, same thing for, for quality of life. Quality of life improved at six months, irrelevant to whether you had uh, PVR, elevated PVR or not. Um, and with regards to the concern about um, uh, RV dilation or elevated RV pressures, uh, right sided pressures, uh, we they didn't see that in this study with, with this device. So no difference in RA pressure, no, no difference in RA volume, no, no difference in RV dimension, uh, and no difference in markers of RV systolic function. Um, so importantly, it doesn't cause, as far as you know, issues with the RV. This is all at six months. Um, continuing with sort of the clinical outcomes of this device, um, low heart failure event rates uh, post implants are three point eight percent compared to forty five percent prior to implant uh, in terms of patient percent of patients with heart failure events and low heart heart failure event rates per patient year at uh, at six month follow up, um, suggesting um, effectiveness of the device. Um, so to sort of summarize this shunt device, it's safe at six months, low event rate, low event rates. Um, all the devices are patent that we looked at or that were looked at. Um, an improvement in both a marker of filling pressures and quality of life uh, without evidence of effects on the right heart function. So to further suss this out, this is being studied in a um, randomized control trial, so all, all flow two study, which we'll be enrolling in once this gets going. Um, and again, so this will be comparing, there's no sham in, in, in the early feasibility study. This wasn't compared to anything. So this will be compared to a sham procedure uh, and assess whether the improvements in, in filling pressures correlate with improvements in, in clinical outcomes. Um, just briefly, there's two other devices out there on the market or that are being studied, I should say. Um, there's the V-Wave device, which is a little bit smaller, five millimeters, sort of trying to skirt the issue of having a big thing in your atrium in case you, in your intraatrial septum, in case you want to go back for another procedure. Uh, and there's this Oculate Tech atrial flow regulator, which actually sort of interestingly gets bigger and smaller based on the pressure gradient. Um, and these are both in phase two trials, so they're still a ways away from, from prime time. Um, um, so, you know, lots of devices in, in different stages of, of, of studies. Um, it'll be interesting to see which device sort of takes off. Um, there's, uh, you know, technically complicated procedures like a left atrium to CS shunt is, you know, more technically complicated than intraatrial septal puncture, which as, you know, lots of intervention, interventional cardiologists do regularly. So, um, uh, safety and, and, and efficacy will depend on, you know, how the devices actually work and then familiarity of, of, of implanters as well.
uh, and we still don't know which patient population is most likely to benefit. That's why it's an area of growing interest for, uh, for me anyways. Um, and then lastly, uh, I want to talk about coronary sinus reduction. Um, so I think everybody knows that there are lots of patients out there with refractory angina despite maximal medical therapy. Um, so encourage 42% of patients in the medical therapy arm and 34% of patients with PCI uh, have refractory angina. Um, and beyond maximal medical therapy, which some patients can't tolerate, uh, there's not really a lot of options out there for patients. So there's EECP, angiogenesis, transmyocardial revascularization, um, uh, but nothing with really robust data. Um, so um, based on a surgical technique, there's this idea that if you create a stenosis or you reduce coronary sinus, um, or reduce drainage from the coronary sinus, you can actually create a trans sinus gradient. So uh, what you do is if you don't let blood flow come out of the coronaries, you increase um, the pressure gradient and you redistribute flow to under perfuse myocardium. So with exercise, normally what happens is your subepicardial arteries all constrict. Um, and that's why some patients get angina, but if you increase this gradient, you can actually improve flow to the subendocardium and potentially reduce angina. So the device that's being studied is this neovasc reducer. Um, so this is just a, wire, a metal mesh um, that's kind of this has this hourglass shape. Uh, it sits in the coronary sinus, creating a stenosis, uh, essentially, um, and it's delivered through a nine French sheath. Um, and it was studied in a in a multi center randomized uh, trial, and it was a sham control trial. Um, and so they took patients with CCS three to four angina. Uh, and evidence of reversible ischemia, so objective evidence of reversible ischemia. Um, and they looked at uh, improvement in CCS grade in 12 months, uh, as well as their technical and procedural success. Um, and what they were able to show in that study is that 35% uh, of patients improved by more than two classes uh, of CCS score, uh, so significantly different. And 71% and, and, uh, of patients had uh, an improvement by at least one class. Um, uh, procedural success was, you know, perfect. 100% of patients, 100% of procedures were successful. Um, they did have 34 serious adverse events, but they included angina as one of their adverse events. So, um, in patients with refractory angina, 34 of them still had refractory angina as one of their adverse events. Uh, but in terms of um, device-related complications, they were actually quite low. And I'll show you the real-world data or the the observational data that's out there. So um, there's this observational study called Producer One, uh, which looked at this device in 228 patients. There's actually retrospective and prospective data, uh, but all observational. Uh, and they show that procedural, procedural events were quite low. So 0.4% procedural events related with this device. Um, uh, low rates of death, major stroke, and MI uh, in a patient population with known severe coronary disease. It's, it's unresponsive to medical therapy. Uh, and in terms of the efficacy in the real world, um, at two years, 82% of patients had a one grade reduction in their uh, in their CCS score, and 31% had two grade reduction in their in their CCS score. So from this study, anyways, improvement in their in their in their angina. Um, so there is this larger multi-center randomized study uh, aiming to answer uncertainty on on uh, on these early results, and uh, we'll hopefully be enrolling that study as well. Um, so just to summarize, transcatheter techniques are sort of blowing up, um, uh, growing at a rapid pace. Lots out there, and I've only sort of touched the tip of the iceberg here with some of the devices that I've shown you. Um, we've got established devices with robust data. Um, uh, the transcatheter therapy for HEFF, HEFREF, and refractory angina has promising early results, and it'll be interesting to see where this technology goes in the next five, ten years, um, which will hopefully be around the time that I'm finished training and able to use these. Um, that's it. Questions? That's great. Thank you, Omar. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, you can um, raise your hand and we'll bring you a microphone uh, in the uh, in the room or put your um, question in the chat.
and uh, and we will um, answer your question. Um, Omar, maybe I'll start. Um, perhaps a naive question, but I'll ask anyways. Um, the interventions where you access the coronary sinus, I presume you have to use some contrast agent to find the sinus and, and guide you. Um, on average, how much contrast do you think you need to use? I'm just thinking in terms of renal dysfunction. Um, is that a, a limitation or you know something to be thought about? Yeah, so, um, so for the LA to CS shunt, um, we do use some contrast, but a lot of the pre-procedural planning is done with CT beforehand. So in terms of the actual procedure, there's not a lot of contrast used. I, I can't give you a number off the top of my head, but I, I think it's probably between 20 and 50 cc, so not a ton for that device. Um, for the other coronary sinus devices, I'm not sure. I, I haven't done them, and I, I, I'd have to dig a little deeper to see. I'm not sure that it's that much. I don't know if anybody has, a, has an idea. Okay, um, and I know that Dr. Labanez and Dr. Hibbert are in the audience. I don't know if um, either of you have comments. Um, Mike, or sorry, Ben, do you want to take the microphone? Well, just the so this is more uh, of a comment, but I'll end it with a question. So uh, in I, I think uh, as practitioners in an academic institute, uh, we're going to see more and more um, device development, which is very different than drug development. So what happens in drug development is you develop a drug, uh, you do a phase two study, and then you you do a large 10,000 patient randomized clinical trial uh, looking for your FDA approval. Uh, with device development, the arc for clinical development for approval is very, very different, which you've just shown. So it always starts with early feasibility studies, which are single arm studies. Um, uh, and the point of those studies is not about demonstrating efficacy. So people often criticize these and say, well, they don't show, um, you know, large effect sizes, uh, but they are really about safety. Uh, they are really about learning how to implant. It's very different uh, to do technical procedures compared to drug development. Uh, as implanters, there's always a massive learning curve in terms of how to actually implant these. Um, and so those early feasibility studies always look worse in terms of procedural complications because the reality is we don't really know what we're doing. Uh, and then ultimately what happens with all of these technologies is once you figure out how to implant them safely, then you go start chasing different patient populations. Uh, and so, uh, you know, a lot of uh, 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 concern uh, that people have with these technologies is when those first clinical trials fail, and that's largely because we've just figured out how to implant and now we're chasing patient populations. And so, I, again, I think the arc of development is very different for these technologies. Uh, and so uh, a lot of the time, uh, I, I hear all the time, uh, you know, interatrial shunts are dead and I don't think so. Uh, I think, you know, the, they, they always swing for the fences on the first trial and they tried to implant everybody and see if they could get an effect and they didn't. And hopefully we learn from that by looking at subgroups and we'll figure out which patient populations uh, benefit. So again, the arc of development is much slower. And I think you see that in everything from, you know, tear to interatrial shunts to left ventricular remodeling. One of the things I think we have to get more comfortable with, again, as an academic institution, uh, and I think it's going to be interesting, is the use of sham controlled trials. So in, in cardiovascular medicine, you know, where we often don't do sham control trials. Uh, some things are very difficult to do sham control trials on, uh, but increasingly that's going to be mandated. And I think when we talk to patients, uh, we need to feel comfortable with that study design. It's going to be required by regulators uh, uh, to get these things approved. And so I think feeling comfortable with our patients being randomized to a sham, uh, uh, I think is going to be really important, uh, especially when a lot of our interventions are going to be looking at improving quality of life, right? Very. I don't think a lot of these interventions are going to improve heart outcomes like mortality. Uh, so I think that, you know, we need to feel more comfortable uh, randomizing patients uh, to sham control trials. So I think, you know, as we see these technologies development uh, develop, we're going to see these clinical trials that are designed like this, and we have to feel comfortable uh, uh, with that. And then lastly, uh, you know, I do think that it's really important that we continue to participate in these these types of studies so that we get access to these technologies earlier for our patients uh, and we get to learn uh, with the companies uh, which of these technologies uh, actually end up helping our patients. All right, great job.
Uh, Omar, there's a question from uh, Dr. Sure. Burwash, I believe. Um, so what are your thoughts on uh, the future of tricuspid valve clipping versus tricuspid valve replacement for severe TR? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, the first study on, on transcatheter tricuspid interventions was just published, and it, the first thing that we've seen is, is a quality of life outcome. So I think the field is still open. We don't really know what's going to work and what's going to work best. So I'll be watching with with sort of bated breath to see what works the best for which patients. I'm not sure what will work, and I'm not sure which patients will benefit the most from which technology. Um, I don't think it'll be a home run. There'll be a single home run the way there was with Tabby. I think there will be patients that that benefit from one technique or one technology versus another technology, uh, and who benefits from what is to be determined. Uh, Dr. Beanlands has a question. Yeah, thanks. That was awesome. Really great rounds. Thanks. I uh, learned a lot. Um, just to Ben's comment, I'm not so sure that the pathway is so different. Like you do do drug safety and you do do randomization. Um, I think the key, I think the point about the sham piece is really key because that's a true or a truer placebo, if you will. So, but uh, those were excellent, excellent points. I, I do think the the arc is different in terms of the time frame, um, and there's the acceleration, and you've showed it here today. It's like amazing how many things are out there. Um, my question to you is, um, when should be, and I, I'm thinking specifically about tricuspid right now, but it could be mitral and others, when should we be referring for this type of procedure? I find sometimes we're thinking about it too late. Um, the patients, you know, edematous, they got severe TR and their uh, pulmonary pressures are high, et cetera. So which patients should we be referring at, and at what time point? You know, if they've got some bad TR, they don't have much in the way of right heart failure clinically. Um, are those the types of patients we should be for referring? How far along in their trajectory should we send them along? Yeah. My short answer is is early, like earlier. Um, the worst that can happen is that you see a patient who's not a candidate, and and they're at least sort of in the queue in the system um, for you know the intervention that we have now or the interventions that we'll have in, in seven to ten years. Uh, and and it's like you said, we oftentimes see patients who are who are sort of too far gone. You see a patient with severe TR, but their their pulmonary pressure is eighty, uh, and you know that you're unlikely to have a clinical impact. Um, so I you know I think. Uh, it, it's not unreasonable to, to refer patients who have moderate to severe asymptomatic valve disease for assessment. And then, you know, if they're not, and, and that's sort of the way I've seen other places sort of practice uh, across the world. Um, it's not unreasonable to, to refer them, um, have them assessed, and then as technologies and as they become candidates, uh, have them have their procedure. It's just like you said, a lot of patients end up too sick for for intervention and they're unlikely to benefit from the intervention when they're that sick. OK, that's great. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Burwash does have a comment. I don't know if it's a question, but there's a comment um, where he says it's hard to truly blind despite a sham procedure. They all get echoes and someone such as the sonographer can inadvertently spill the beans to the patient. So. Uh, there you go. That's that editorial comment from the Echo Lab. Uh, yeah, it's just it's hard to to keep the sham a sham when they go to the Echo Lab. Our bad. Uh, <laughs> OK, Omar, that was excellent. Um, there is. Um, uh, a comment from Dr. Uh, Quan Chan um, for TR, the uh, TRI score, which actually was developed by Dr. Masika here, appears to be a good way to select patients. Not sure if you have any comments about that, but uh, for those of you that aren't aware, there is a TRI score which risk stratifies patients for uh, surgical uh, complications, post tricuspid valve replacement, yeah. I believe. Yeah. Uh, you know, the assessment is is complex, obviously, um, uh, and yeah, yeah, so. For sure helpful. OK, that's excellent. If no one has any other comments or questions, we'll close for today. Thank you so much, Omar. That was an excellent summary of the field.
everyone please uh, register for next week's grand rounds. Um, I think it's Dr. Rulo that's coming to present. So have a good week. We'll see you next week.